very much for being with us here this morning. Uh, my name is Bill Taylor. I'm the Acting Executive Vice President here at the United States Institute of Peace. And I'm very pleased to welcome you and Sheikh Anucci um, back to the Institute of Peace. Um, people in this room um, will not need introductions to Sheikh Anucci, uh, nor to Robin Wright, who I will introduce in a moment. You, may, you, may, you probably wonder who this is, rather than these two people are. Um, we are very pleased to welcome back Sheikh Anucci. Um, head, of course, of the Anatha Party uh, in Tunisia, one of the two major parties that will be uh, contesting uh, the elections that come up next month, the parliamentary elections next month, um, and then presidential elections uh, the following month. So this is a very timely visit to hear the story, again, uh, of the democratic success of Tunisia. Um, Sheikh Anucci just spent some time with some journalists upstairs and he made the point that uh, Tunisia is a candle in the dark um, of, of what we normally read about going on in the Middle East. Um, this is a point of light um, that, that we should know about, that we should support. Uh, so we're very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Sheikh Anucci back. Um, I mentioned Robin Wright. Um, who will be uh, the discussant um, after Sheikh Anucci gives his opening remarks. Robin, again, you all know well, um, uh, she is here at the Institute of Peace, but we share her with the Wilson Center um, jealously, I would say, but she likes our building better. So that, that's why uh, we, we have, have her regularly. She's reported from more than 140 countries on six continents, has won the National Magazine Award for the New Yorker work, Overseas Press Club, Overseas Press Club Award for best reporting uh, in any medium requiring exceptional courage and initiative, and the National Press Club Award for the best diplomatic reporting. So we're very pleased to have uh, Robin with us. Um, let me also thank uh, Radwan Masmuri, who is here, right here. Um, he and the Institute uh, of the, for the, the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy have made this all possible. Radwan, thank you very much. Uh, the embassies of Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt are also with us here this morning, and we're very pleased, in particular, to have the ambassador of Tunisia and the ambassador of, uh, of uh, Algeria with us. Um, that, those are our introductions. Uh, the way we're going to work this here is Sheikh Anucci will uh, open, he'll give his address. Um, it will be in Arabic, I think we agreed, much to Robin's disappointment, but uh, uh, you will have your headsets, so be prepared to put those on. Be sure, we'll make sure they're working before uh, Sheikh Anucci starts. Following that address, Robin will have her remarks. And following that, we'll have a discussion. Um, and that's where you come in. So I look forward to your questions and comments. Um, we will have mics, so all you need to do is raise your hand. You can ask directly uh, these questions. Sheikh Anushi has an important meeting with the State Department right across the street. Um, and we'll have to leave right at 1130. He will depart. We'll all sit here um, as he leaves. Um, and so that, that will all work about 1130 and, and shortly thereafter. Um, let me again welcome you here. Thank everyone for making this possible. Sheikh Anucci, the podium is yours. Thank you. Sabah. Assalamu alaikum. Anna, uh, good morning. Peace be upon you. Big because my English is not uh, well enough uh, and uh, I will be ready to uh, respond to your questions in my English as it is. <laughs> I would like to start by expressing my delight to at delivering this lecture at this great intellectual institution on the situation of the Middle East, which I personally do not see as being in a crisis, but rather at a crossroads between going towards, democr uh, towards democracy, development and progress, and between the relapse of Arab Spring and the spread of Caius, terrorism, and civil uh, wars and sectarianism. A few years ago, the world was watching with excitement uh, the great masses of people flooding squares 
and roads in Tunisia to Tripoli, Cairo and Sana'a demanding freedom dignity and the departure of dictators and repressive regimes. The so-called Arab exception a collapse before the will of the youth. Uh, the Arab exceptional that the Arab does not, uh, they are not good for democracy. And it was no longer possible for anyone to describe for Arabs and Muslims as unworthy of democracy or um, their political culture as rooted in the philosophy of oriental despotism or that support of the uh, uh, repressive regime uh, by the free world is a necess necessary choice in order to avoid the risk of power falling into Islamists, the enemies of Western civilization. These stereotypes have broken down and the Arab Spring became a source of inspiration for the uh, people of the world before facts on the grounds changed and forces uh, pulling backwards and working to counter the revolution succeeded to drone uh, the Syrian revolution, terrorism disputes and div divisions before matters in Libya deteriorated towards chaos, chaos and before Egypt returned to military rule. Uh, the question now is why do the map uh, of the Middle East changed so fast from a promising democratic movement to hot spots of conflict and tensions. In the cause of that rise, is the cause of that uh, the rise of Islamists to power and their failure to govern and to build stable democratic systems. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen I will attempt to present a reading that can be taken as an, uh, an introduction or a viewpoint towards understanding what is happening in the region, which is ge geographically distant from you while being closely linked to the most geo uh, strategic questions which draw your attention uh, uh, on uh, and that of your governments. My reading is based on the reality of Tunisia's experience, uh, the last lit candle of the Arab Spring. Tunisia has succeeded in, acqu in acquiring a modernist uh, constitution that stipulates freedom of conscience, uh, guarantees the rights of women and minorities, and is the fruit of joint work between moderate secularists and moderate Islamists. Tunisia also succeeded to overcome the political crisis uh, it experienced last year thanks to the national dialogue which culminated a, consen a consensus over an independent government tasked with guaranteeing the right conditions for uh, holding elections which are uh, to be held in next few weeks. Tunisia is also engaged in a successful war against terrorism, which began under the Troika government led by Al Nahda, which on uh, August, and 20, uh, August 27, uh, 27, uh, 2013, designated Al Ansar, Ansar al Sharia as a terrorist organization, uh, arresting dozens of its leaders, dismantling its cells, and foiling many of its operations despite the cowardly attacks against our military and security forces. The question we have to ask now, why did Tunisia succeed? The answer, which I think it's, uh, uh, I believe it's evident and common, uh, is that democracy is possible in the Middle East as long as its conditions are present. There is no Arab exception. There is no contradiction between Islam and democracy. And dictatorship is not necessarily a destiny. Why did in uh, uh, Tunisia uh, succeed then? And why did other fail? Tunisia succeeded thanks to a variety of factors uh, which unfortunately were not present in the required level in other experiences. The first one is the rejection of domination of monopoly of power. Al Nahda party, which uh, won the majority uh, in the elections of the National Constituent Assembly in 2011, refused the, to, do, uh, dominate, to dominate the power. We called for a national unity government after t uh, the 
uh, 2011 elections and we are able to form coalition government with two secular parties, Atakatul and the CPR. From the beginning, al uh, party was always uh, has always uh, been committed to the establishment of a political system where seculars and Islamists coexist. That was not always easy. Uh, but Anahda's uh, Anahda's compromises were always the principal catalyst for resolving crisis and for accelerating the adoption of the constitution. Coexistence with uh, secularists was the result of a reformist intellectual process, and uh, in which our party was the first Islamic movement to adopt democracy in 1981 and announce explicitly that it is a civic party that believes in democracy, uh, citizenship, and civic values. It, it is a conviction uh, that uh, which we did not uh, change even after the savage wave of uh, repression in 1990s uh, to which we were subjected to Bin Ali's regime's uh, violence. Anahda uh, remained a peaceful movement struggling against dictatorship through democratic uh, methods and rejecting violence extremism. Uh, refusing domination of power and opting for ex coexistence uh, between secularists and Islamists were two important factors in the success of the Tunisian model. The uh, next important factor in Tunisia's uh, success is the adoption of what we call the consensus politics. Uh, this is based on our uh, belief that during transitional periods ruling uh, uh, ruling a majority of 50% uh, plus one does not lead to a stable political system and that was as needed um, uh, as is a wide consensus uh, and, w and what is needed was a wide consens consensus as possible between the main political trends whether in the majority or minority uh, that's why we wanted to con uh, a constitution that does not just represent the simple majority, but one that represents uh, the widest, um, the, major uh, the majority possible. The princi this principle of consensus uh, has succeeded in saving Tunisia from many of the crises uh, that in it faced through a national dialogue that brought together. Uh, all the political trends uh, represented by 22 parties with no exclusions. The national dialect succeeded in uh, producing a constitution support, supported by 94% of the constitu uh, constituent assembly. It also succeeded in creating the consensus of the uh, completion of the democratic transition process through the agreement on an independent election commission uh, and on dates for the elections. Many of these successes were the fruit of the sacrifices made by the majority party to preserve the country's unity. First, we conceded key ministries, then we conceded the government. It was not an easy decision, but Anahda adopted that decision by overwhelming majority because it is, res uh, it is a responsible party that puts the country's interest uh, above its own and uh, realizes that uh, guaranteeing freedom for all Tunisian, uh, Tunisians uh, is more important than clinging to power if uh, uh, that led to uh, division and conflict. The fourth factor, in my opinion, is firm uh, opposition to the political exclusion and uh, for refusal to exclude all members of uh, the dissolved former ruling party despite the dangers of allowing uh, of them to operate politically. We saw the effects of exclusion and eradication in several experiences. Uh, the most recent of whom is Libya um, and, cho and chose instead to leave it uh, to the people to decide and not to uh, treat those who oppressed, imprisoned and tortured uh, us and spread uh, corruption and despotism like they trade treated uh, their opponents for decades. The fifth is related to the nature of the Tunisian military institution, which is a Republican institution opposed to coups. 
uh, which stood by the people during the revolution and committed itself to the protection of the democratic transition. It also uh, true of the security institution which has recovered its effectiveness and soundness. This, ladies and gentlemen, the success of Tunisian revolution is not a coincidence, uh, but is a, uh, the fruit of a consensual um, process led by another party in collaboration with other partners, political parties and organizations such as uh, the Workers' Union and Chamber of Commerce. The problem is that, the, uh, that this success does not negate the existence of the serious dangers threatening it. In light of the determination of some uh, of abort, uh, to abort uh, all the Arab Spring experiments in order to demonstrate uh, that the Middle Seas is not eligible for democracy and that the only appropriate place for Islamists uh, is prison, torture, cells, and exile. You will be told here in the United States that the best option for the region is dictatorship in order to preserve peace. Uh, just as our people are told that they can only enjoy security, prosperity, and progress under despotic regimes. In response, we say that this idea is not a new one and that it has been tried in the past. Uh, support for dictatorships in the Middle East in the uh, past led the disaster in the region. Um, uh, in the world as and has led to the emergence of spread of terrorism in the region and throughout the world and ultimately also led to the uh, revolutions themselves. We also say that linking Islam and violence will only uh, give extremists great greater scope to attract broad sectors of youth and that young Arabs feeling that there is no genuine commitment to supporting democracy can lead to feelings of disappointment and uh, further bitterness towards themselves, their societies and towards the other. And, and we say uh, uh, and we say that the absence of just uh, and comprehensive peace in the Middle East will only feed uh, further tension and hatred. I return to my first question. Is, uh, is it a crisis or a, cris a crossroads? The Tunisian model, ladies and gentlemen, demonstrates that it is possible for you to trust the people of the Middle East um, and that the duty and that the duty requires all friends of freedom and democracy in the free world to help regions continue its progress towards freedom and modernity. We appreciate the reference to Tunisia president. We appreciate that the reference to Tunisia in uh, President Obama's speech at the UN General Assembly where he mentioned Tunisia as a positive example of coexistence between Islamic and secular parties. We also appreciated when he stressed that the war on ISIM is not war on Islam and that it cannot lead to a clash of civilizations. I believe it is very important to strongly defend and promote this approach because because confusing Islam and terrorism can only benefit terrorists themselves who uh, oppose democracy and consider it to be un-Islamic and also benefit dictators who know that prisons of democratic states that guarantee freedom, justice and the rule of law hinder uh, their establishment of regimes uh, based on corruption and repression. It is important to stress that uniquely security so solution uh, and fighting terrorism is not enough and that relying on a security solution will complicate this uh, problem even more in the short and long term as well as security. We need to tackle uh, this problem at the political level through the support of democracy and 
inclusiveness. Uh, we also need to tackle this um, at uh, the religious intellectual levels by showing that the extreme of understand extreme understanding of Islam that they have is wrong. We should not also forget the socioeconomic dimension in the fighting against the disease. In Tunisia, we have defeated dictatorships, not we have uh, now we hope that we are on our way to defeating uh, terrorism by showing that there is no contradiction between Islam and democracy and by building a growing economy. I believe that democratic Islam is the anti-thesis anti to despotism, despotism uh, preventing it from imposing choice between security and freedom. With this vision, Tunisia goes forward towards a new phase in our democratic process where we will, uh, we will uh, for the second time since the revolution, seek the people's will. It is an, uh, um, it is an event which uh, uh, we wish to use uh, an occasion to strengthen the unity of, this, of society and build a strong partnership for power. And Nahda has willingly uh, made a further concession in order to ensure the success of the coming phase by choosing not to put forward a candidate uh, for the presidential elections and calling for a national unity government that brings uh, together various uh, parties because we believe that Tunisia cannot be managed by a simple 50 per 10 plus one major majority in the coming years. Based on a profound reading of the crisis of the region, uh, the causes of which include low development uh, indicators, high youth unemployment, we chose uh, the slogan, which is the slogan of Anahda's electoral program to be towards a rising economy and a secure country. Out of uh, the realization of the dangers resulting from uh, delayed development solutions as a result of the fragile economic situation in our country, I appeal to Tunisia's friends to offer the necessary financial support to the current government and future governments um, and uh, not to wait and to, not to await investments that require a long time and specific conditions for their execution. Uh, I was keen to come to Washington D.C. to Washington, uh, despite uh, uh, being engaged in a busy election campaign. Uh, we need the international cooperation based on the defense of freedom and democracy, while the Muslim world needs to uh, make uh, greater efforts uh, in uh, the field of uh, reform and renewal, uh, building the modern cultural civilizational systems uh, to that counter uh, uh, extremism and rigidity. Uh, Uh, which is uh, the uh, the vision I have defended for uh, four decades or more that is not uh, possible until we accurately diagnose uh, the causes uh, that brought it to uh, uh, to its current state at the forefront of which we uh, which are the regimes uh, of uh, repression and corruption uh, from this uh, from this platform, I call a reprehensive approach for count. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you. remarks. Um, I think uh, everyone here as well as those viewing will agree that uh, uh, this statement um, of one of the two major parties uh, in Tunisia going into this political season is, is one of hope um, and of encouragement. So thank you very much for that. And Robin, um, would like to make a statement before there is a dialogue? Uh, I have a little bit of a uh, few comments. Um, Sheikh Anushi was reminding me that uh, 25 years ago, we first met, and he sat in my house in Georgetown, and we had uh, a conversation that reflected much of what he said today. There are those who question the 
intention, the sincerity of the uh, Islamist party in Tunisia. And I can verify that going back 25 years, he, has been, he was saying the same things he is today, which I find quite encouraging. I also thought it was very interesting when I once asked him why Tunisia went in one direction and why Egypt went in another when it came to the Islamist party and their visions and their practices. And I thought he was uh, wonderfully candid and I wanted to share what he told me. He said that um, when he went into exile and many of the, those of Inada went into exile, they went to the West. And when the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt went into exile, they went into the Gulf. And in terms of their worldviews, that was very um, informative or it shaped their vision of the world. And I thought that was a kind of candor that was also very helpful. Um, I wanted to point out a number of things uh, in look, taking, kind of standing on top of the world and looking down now on Tunisia and where it stands. Um, Look, this is a precarious transition. It is clearly the most hopeful of any place in the Arab world. Uh, we all hope Tunisia makes it just to, to prove that, that um, the, whether it's the Arab world and democracy, the Islamic world and democracy, that they can coexist and they can make this incredible historic transition. But the fact is uh, Tunisia has faced uh, a lot of challenges, whether it's the assassination of two political leaders last year. Um, the fundamental gap between the ancien regime or the old elites and the, the new crop of politicians. I often worry that in the Arab world there's a little bit too much democracy in that you have 70 candidates who signed up to be president uh, now apparently down to about 21 and the list may come out tomorrow. That when it comes to parliamentary elections, you have 1,327 lists, each one with an average of six candidates, which means 8,000 candidates for 217 seats. And one of the, the, the great challenges of democracy is not just that sense of making everyone understand their rights, which, is, which we've seen happen, whether it was Mohammed Bouazizi in Sidi Bouzid standing up for his individual rights and inspiring millions of others to, to stand up for their rights as well. The other half of democracy is understanding responsibility. And my great concern during this transition, very fragile transition everywhere in the Arab world, is that there isn't that sense of responsibility, that sense of common good that's emerging. And, and we see this everywhere with the proliferation of political parties. There's, as I said, a little, a, bit, a little bit too much democracy because everyone feels they have a right to run and they don't think how can they coalesce, how can they create coherent political parties with a common agenda and give people fewer options because at the end of the day, too many candidates can often marginalize those who might be better for the long-term interests of the country. Um, uh, economically, I think, is, is the area that I worry the most about Tunisia. Uh, this was, after all, a revolution that was started for economic reasons. Mohamed Bouazizi was not standing up because he wanted a liberal democracy or a democracy at all. He was standing up for the dignity of a job and that's really what it's ultimately about. And I went um, uh, a year later to Sidi Bouzid to see what had happened and to talk to the young people and to see the extraordinary monument in honor of Bouazizi. And uh, all the young were talking about, they still didn't have jobs. And I think we're seeing this across the Arab world and that the, the, that the instability ahead will be defined not just by demographics, not by, just by education and access of the accessibility to a sense of rights, to knowing what's happened elsewhere in the world, to know what people um, have a right uh, in terms of politics, but the fact that they can't get those jobs. And they tried democracy once, they tried protests, and the danger is that they go to, they get lured by extremism. In many ways, I think, the, the appeal of extremism today is a result of the failure of that very brief democratic um, window. Um, 
The World Bank issued a report this week that, that pointed out that Tunisia needs a lot of really basic reforms that overhaul the system, that 50% of the economy is closed off to investment. And that in turn limits job creation, that creates this cycle that it's really hard to break out of. Um, corruption, you know, corruption has not gone away. Tunisia is in many ways not as bad as some uh, other countries, but it's still a very serious issue. Uh, the World Bank said there's heavy state regulation has become a smoke screen for crony practices, which is also known as corruption. There's a very weak demand in Europe for Tunisian exports, and this, of course, is fundamental to um, economic health. This is where Tunisia does rely on Western markets, European markets, and if 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 that it's not just what aid we provide, it's the, it's the Europeans that are so crucial to the success of the Tunisian economy. Um, the third area of concern is the security forces and the judiciary. The security forces have not gone through the kind of reforms necessary, in part because of the threat of extremism. And this, I think, goes to what Sheikh Anoushi was saying very profoundly about getting trapped in this cycle that you get caught up fighting terrorism and you don't get to engage in the democracy that addresses whether it's uh, the sense of they're not, people feel that the security forces are protecting them, not just going after extremists. And this is, is something that's at the core of uh, the Ancien Regime, its problem in using uh, its, its uh, force, um, sometimes whimsically, arbitrarily, unjustly. And there's the danger that in fighting terrorism without security force reform, that that, that old problem is perpetuated. Um, when it comes to the issue of justice, we've, we're finding again that there has been no, there have been no charges, as far as I know, filed against those who were responsible for the assassinations last year. That there is this gap um, between what people want and what's being uh, delivered. Um, and then, finally, looking at the region, and this is where Tunisia is important as an example, but it is also so vulnerable to what's happening in neighboring um, Libya, particularly. Uh, there was great hope that Libya and Tunisia would have a kind of relationship in the aftermath of their political transformations so that one could provide the expertise and the other the, the, re the oil re resources, the oil revenues, that these two countries could feed off each other and build a stronger uh, block in North Africa that would um, be to their mutual benefit. And with the tragedy is that the relationship now is uh, Tunisia is taking in a lot of Libyan refugees. There's the spillover of arms, the seepage of extremists across the border, um, and that, that the two countries are destabilizing um, each other uh, in a tragic way. Um, President Marzouki was at the United Nations last week and, and spoke, and, and I was up there as well. And, and I was struck particularly by one of his quotes. He said, um, in fighting ISIS, without addressing, addressing the roots of the problem, it seems to me, as a physician, as he is, to take the symptoms but not cure the disease. And I think that's the problem. You fight extremism, but you're not dealing with the root causes that created the upheaval, the unrest in the, in the beginning. And as a result, you perpetuate, even deepen. Um, uh, you know, on the, on, and this, I'll close with this because I know you're really all here to hear what Sheikh Anushi has to say. Um, having spent most of my professional life covering uh, the Islamic world, the Middle East, um, uh, I have to say that I feel exhausted at the moment um, in trying to explain that Islam and democracy actually are com compatible. And I think Americans feel rather exhausted by it as well right now. Um, there was a sense after 9-11, it took a while for people to understand that Al-Qaeda was something different, that Al-Qaeda didn't reflect 
the will of the majority of, of Muslims or the majority of the Arab world. But with the rise of ISIS, with the extraordinary numbers that are flocking to its cause, um, I think that issue becomes even larger than it was in the aftermath of 9-11. Al-Qaeda was much smaller than ISIS is. It didn't have territory. Uh, and I think the, the fear that the practice of beheadings, whether um, there have been nine beheadings in the Sinai as well, that uh, groups that are not part of ISIS, but this is the new tactic, that there is this, the idea of barbarity is something that um, it haunts us and is very hard um, to convince a lot of Americans that it's worth yet another investment in this part of the world. I fear that Americans are going to be um, very impatient when it comes to results. And I think, tragically, the ISIS war is going to be far longer than anything we've fought so far. Um, and, and so I wish you well, um, because I think you've been saying a lot of the right things for a long time. But I think making the case is going to be harder and harder and harder. So, making that case, um, uh, that's exactly why we want to have this conversation, uh, give uh, Sheikh Tanucci the opportunity to make this case, because I agree with Robin that it needs to be made, and this is, uh, this is why we are so pleased to have. Um, Sheikh Tanucci, you mentioned in your remarks that President Obama um, at the UN uh, singled out uh, Tunisia as, uh, as a model as, uh, uh, and, and, and this is, uh, as you've indicated, uh, democracy is the answer to a lot of the problems that, that Robin has talked about. Last night, um, in, on, in an interview uh, on 60 Minutes, uh, President Obama elaborated on this uh, theme uh, that we've been talking about here, and, and he opined that the conflict uh, between Shia and Sunni in the Islamic world um, is not just the main source of conflict, and USIP cares about conflict. Well, this is what we do here. We try to address conflict. And President Obama said that the, the, the biggest source of conflict, not just in the Middle East, but in the world, was this Shia-Sunni schism, um, conflict, tension. Um, you, as one of the preeminent Islamic scholars, philosophers, spokesmen um, will have views on this. Um, what would you, how would you evaluate that claim that it's the largest source of conflict in the world? Yes, the conflict is uh, very serious and very dangerous. It can threat the Muslim Ummah, Muslim unity, and uh, he can, this problem can disturb the, the regime. But not uh, in, uh, not, uh, I think it's, uh, this uh, conflict cannot uh, shape or shape the the world. constitute a real uh, element of, uh, of war. Um, Shia is a mus Muslim minority between 10% uh, or 15% of Muslim. They live during the Islamic uh, history as part of Muslim nation, Muslim Ummah, Muslim civilization. Uh, 
So this problem can affect Muslim unity and affect the region, but uh, it can be solved through uh, dialogue, through mix, mixed, uh, mixed uh, recognize or uh, exchange, recognize mutual, recognize between uh, two two parts. I think the problem is the extremism, the Sunni extremism and the Shi'i extremism. But uh, because uh, the plurality within Islam is acceptable during Islamic history, all fractions, all, uh, all, uh, all uh, minorities, all madhahab have been uh, coexist, coexist. Because in Islam there isn't any spokesman, there isn't any uh, the notion of church, no spokesman of God in earth. So the, there is a free interpretation of Islamic texts. So from Islam, many, many sort of interpretation, many Islam can be a reference of uh, uh, unlimited, unlimited interpretation and interpre uh, unlimited uh, uh, ideologies and uh, uh, and uh, parties, so the problem is not there isn't Shia in, in the region or Sunnah, the problem is the extremism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Extremism means pretending that uh, Islam is uh, pretending that uh, this fraction or this uh, group is a representer of God in earth. And he can legitimize using violence against others who, who, doesn't, who don't share his views. So all Muslim has to fight the extremism because extremism the, is the base of terrorism. And uh, uh, because the society is plural, Islam is plural, any sort of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, pretending that there is uh, this, uh, this interpretation of Islam is the, the only one accepted, so he can base, he can make or uh, constitute base of extremism, base of uh, terrorism. The so ter terrorism and extremism is not uh, danger uh, for Islam. Is danger for is not danger against the West, but danger for Islam also, because uh, ter uh, extremism uh, seed the fragmentation, seed the element of war within the Ummah. Muslim nation cannot be unified only through plurality of interpretation. So for, for democracy. Can I just say one Please, thing? Rob. You know, I admire you for saying that. And, but I'm not sure that is a, a belief shared by some of your um, brethren. When I look at a place like Saudi Arabia, which has a very narrow interpretation of Islam and is not pluralistic in its tolerance of not only uh, others within the faith, its own Shiite community, but uh, when it comes to Christians, it or Jews, I mean, you, Jews are not allowed in Saudi Arabia. Um, you have to declare what your religion is on your visa application. 
that um, th I've been there for religious holidays and they don't allow people to even have a Christmas tree if they work, they happen to be foreigners who work at the Aramco complex, for example. Um, they don't allow non-Muslims to be buried in their soil. Um, that, that the idea of tolerance is one that um, may be enshrined in the faith, but it is not practiced in many parts of the Islamic world today. And following up that, so why is it that Tunisia does demonstrate that tolerance? Um, as Robin says, it's not, it's not universal. It's not universal in the rest of the world for that matter. But in Tunisia, more so, what, what is it about the Tunisian society, history, culture, that, uh, that enables this democracy to work? I, I think that uh, Tunisian society is the most Arab society, the most unified. Hom homogeneous. Homogeneous. Tunisia has the same religion, the same religion, the same language, the same race. So it's make easy the revolution in Tunisia, mm. this, uh, this uh, unity. Because uh, Ben Ali is, uh, is isolated finally. And he didn't uh, find any part of the society who is linked with him, like, uh, for example, the Alawite in Syria. They link it with Assad. Mm -hmm. So 10% or 50%, they, they consider that their future is linked with the ruler. So they fight with him until uh, w without limit. But in Tunisia, the ruler, Ben Ali, finds himself finally very isolated because uh, Tunisia has no ma minorities, no... Uh, so the, there isn't any problem of uh, conflict between Shia and Sunnah in Tunisia. There is very tiny minorities, well, 500 or 1,000 person. They, they don't uh, cons uh, constitute any real plurality. So uh, we, I don't know exactly what happened uh, the, the, in Arabia Saudi, but I know that there is a Shia in Arabia Saudi also. There is part of Saudi um, constituted by Shia, and many fraction of Shia in Arabia Saudi. There is a coexistence in, in Arabia Saudi between uh, Shia and Sunnah. There isn't any sort of war in, in Arabia Saudi, a religious war. And there is Sufism also in, within the Sunnah. There is many madhab. The dominated one is Hanbali, but there, is, uh, there are other, other madhab in, in Arabia Saudi also. Can I ask one question? Please, Rob. Um, and then, and then uh, we will turn to you. Um, so we're glad to have your questions. But Robin, go ahead. You spoke eloquently about extremism and the f war against extremism. Uh, the United States is looking for allies to support the coalition against ISIS. Would you support Tunisia playing a role, whether it's through um, providing you know, military, some military role, or playing a political role, should it actively join this new coalition? If, why or we, why not? We don't, we don't need to join this war because we are in this war. <laughs> we are in, we are in against ours. Already we are, last year, the the, the Nahda government consider uh, Ansar al-Sharia is a fraction of Al-Qaeda as a terrorist group and uh, uh, declare war against this, uh, this fraction. So we are in this uh, war against uh, the terrorism because uh, Ansar al-Sharia uh, 
belong to the Al Qaeda, to the I, I see, I see ISIS also. All right, let me put that question a different so way. So we are occupied with ours. <laughs> but you still want, there still is a coalition and the U.S. is looking for formal support from the Arab world as a sign of legitimacy. So do you support the U.S. military action against ISIS in both Iraq and Syria? I said we are in fighting, we are fighting against the terrorism in our country. We are occupied if we succeed to liberate our, uh, to save our uh, experience from this uh, disease. Uh, it's it's a good part of this, uh, of this uh, uh, battle. But I still ask you. Yeah. You got the answer. You got that. Yeah, you got the answer. I think he you didn't got answer my we question. We have an ambassador here as well. Who this okay. So let me uh, ask you if you have questions. Uh, you can follow on Robin's question if you want. Uh, 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 for a second. Let's let us go right here, right next to here. Yes, sir. If you'll state your name. I'm Ahmed Adin Ahmed with the Minaret of Freedom Institute. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa uh, I wanted to ask you about the comment you made in your uh, formal remarks uh, welcoming uh, uh, foreign aid in, uh, bef before waiting for conditions to change so that investment would be, uh, you know, attracted. Uh, and I'm asking you, do you think that that kind of policy might not might remove the incentives from both the government and the people to make the reform, economic reforms that are necessary in order to make economic prosperity successful? I think that uh, what, like what uh, Robin said, the revolution in Tunisia is made by uh, youth. Uh, who, uh, who are uh, unemployed, they have a job, they revolt against the unjust, social injustice, and uh, as long as uh, their needs will, ne will not be responded, so another revolution can be can be repeated in Tunisia. So the social problem, now we resolve the political problem in Tunisia by accepting, drafting the constitution, but uh, now we move toward the social problem and we tackle, we have, we tackle this problem uh, believing that without solving this problem, uh, the demands, real demands of the revolution will not be done, will not be satisfied. Just to follow up on that question, because... So we have to invest, I think the West can invest in democracy. Democracy is worth to be, to invest for it and to encourage invest, uh, investors to come to Tunisia to invest, uh, to uh, as, assist the Tunisian economy. I think uh, this is uh, uh, the best way to, to confront the terrorism, to confront the extremism. It's a very, it's a very good point about the request for investment and your Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister came a couple of months ago and made exactly this point, invest in democracy, invest yes. in the startup um, yes. in Tunisia. Yes. Um, the investment from the United States and from the international community, uh, both private and public, yes. will be important. Robin pointed out the economic challenges. Um, uh, so part of your message here in Washington and in, at Yale and at Columbia um, will be to encourage that kind yes. of economic investment. Yes. Um, yes, we promise that we will ease the condition of investment to encourage the investors. But uh, this problem is uh, uh, very important. Without solving the social issues, the uh, tra period of transition, democratic transition will be threatened. 
one of one of the members of uh, your coalition in the parliament yes. um, would like to uh, make a contribution here. My name is uh, Amel Azouz. I'm uh, a deputy at the National Constituent Assembly in my block, in Nahda, block of Nahda. And I'm also a member of the political board of my party and uh, the Shura Council of my party. I'd like to build on what Sheikh Rashid has just mentioned now, and the question is a very good question as well. We know that we need now, as a nascent democracy, we need people, our friends, investing in this democracy. We need that. But your question is good. Uh, in the previous period, I mean, during these three years, we've been busy building the new democracy, this politically, I mean building it uh, politically uh, through the new constitution, the inclusive, if you want, uh, constitution and the cons consensual uh, government and all of that political basis, if you want. Now, if you uh, uh, have a look at the programs, at our programs for the coming elections, which will be held on the 26th of October, you'll notice that there is a focus on these, what you have been just saying now, on these reforms. Reforms, for example, of the subsidy, of the taxation system, of the investment system, of the banking and financial institution. We are aware that the change should start from inside, from our, if you want, from our wills, if you want. But then, at the same time, we know that financially and at the level of AIDS, we still need our friends' assistance so that, as Sheikh Rashid uh, said, this revolution exploded because of people uh, uh, um, yearning and, uh, uh, food on, uh, for food on the table, for jobs, etc. Unless you meet those expectations, you, you cannot carry on this process. It's a democratic process. So, uh, uh, I don't know about the other parties, but uh, uh, concerning my party and the program of my party, there is a real focus on policies, on new policies. And this was not uh, easy in a transitional government or transitional period, but with an entrenched government, an established democracy, an established government, this would be much easier. Okay, I mean, Thank real, you. real Thank and uh, uh, structural reforms. Yes, uh, right back here, please. Ah, and right up on, right here. Thank you. Coming here, right. It's uh, Mohamed Wafa from the MBN. Uh, I have a question about the uh, the future of Nada. Nada had pledged not to introduce a candidate in the presidential election. How do you fathom the Nada's rule? in the near future, in the two or three or four years to come, would be more involvement in the dealings of government or the Nahda will be uh, a movement that only introduces ideas and some uh, new understanding of the political scene. This is my first question. Second one, I will make it very quick about the labor syndicate. In the last couple of years, there was more rule, and actually effective one, during the political crisis in Tunisia. Do you think the labor syndicate will have more role in the coming years, or other parties and factors might be introduced, like the military? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Nahda has not uh, present a presidential pre can candidate. candidate. Why? Even Nahda is the main party. As uh, so far, Nahda is the first party in Tunisia, according to the last elections. The next elections, what uh, will be happen? I, th I think that Nava uh, will still the main party or among the main party in Tunisia. Why Nava abstain? Abstain. Abstain the, of uh, uh, presenting a candidate because 
we believe that our country is still in period of uh, transitional transitional <coughs> so in the normal democracy with 51 percent you can rule leg uh, legitimate but in uh, period of transition is not enough the government has to base to on uh, on very vast majority ibn khaldun said al asabiya asabiya qawiya government has to to bigotry Uh, so, if we Nahda as the main party, if we uh, succeed to gain the majority in the parliament, and uh, we will uh, have a right to uh, appoint the prime minister and the government, what left for others? So we'll be find ourselves in Egyptian scenario. We will face sort of polarization in the society. Polarization is very dangerous for transitional democracy. So we control our desires. We control, uh, we prevent ourselves from going to this stage of domination. We prevent our, uh, our movement to dominate the scene because dominate, dominate the scene is uh, constitute the real danger for the transitional uh, period which uh, we are. So we are very keen to sharing power with the main parties, even with the main uh, force, social forces like trade unions and chamber of, uh, of, uh, of commerce. Of commerce. So it's because we frame we ourselves, we prevent ourselves from uh, going to the presidency. Shekhan, if I can just follow up on that, and then I know we have a question right here. Um, uh, so Kaira Esepsi, the leader of Nida Tunis, uh, another strong party um, in, in Tunisia, um, will certainly challenge um, all of the uh, electoral outcomes uh, uh, in Anada. Uh, so there will be a, a real democracy, a real competition um, there. But building on your, following up on your point about 51% is not good enough in a transitional yes, yes. democracy. Yes. You need a broader. Yes, broader. So if in the election on the 26th of October, in the parliamentary election, it's pretty close, and the polls yes, indicate yes. that Nida Tunis is not the yes. pretty close. How do you get this broader, broader coalition? We are ready to cooperate with the fruits of ballot box. The results of ballot box without any veto against anyone. Mr. Sebsi, sometimes uh, he said that uh, he will not share power with Islamists. We, we never said that. We are ready to share power with the results of the ballot box because this is the 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 will the people. We have to respect the will of our people. If the people uh, elect two or three or five uh, parties, we have to uh, cooperate with them because this is the interest of Tunisia. The process of democracy, the success of this process is more important for us than than the uh, than the Nahda interests. The, 
than, than our party. Because if the process continues, if we, are, we will not in the government this time, we will we'll be in government in other time. But if the process collapses, we will move from the power to the prison. From the <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not... <laughs> Uh, did you, uh, yes, ma'am. Please. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I have two quick questions. And introduce yourself. Marissa Bild, I'm a European diplomat. Yes. Uh, Robin put the onus on you saying you have to continue making the case. It's very difficult, etc., etc. My question to you is that your experience, is this your sentiment that people on the other side is hearing the case, and here I'm thinking in particular about the US, you're going to the State Department after this. Uh, we saw President Obama meeting with President uh, Morsi, uh, President Sisi, sorry, last week. Uh, something he didn't do with uh, President uh, Morsi two years ago. What does that, how does that make you feel? Do you have any reflection on this? Was there something that sort of went through your head when you saw that? And secondly, we are all putting all our money on Tunisia. This is the model case democracy, and you have explained why it was a success. At the same time, Tunisia is the country that um, has most foreign fighters in, in Iraq and Syria, more than Saudi Arabia. How do you explain that? Well. I, I think that uh, uh, the political of CSL uh, Waqia in the real politics, sometimes uh, uh, can lead to opposition, some opposition which can be seen is not acceptable. Like, for example, uh, um, uh, the cooperation between the United States and the uh, system or the regime of uh, Sisi. Mm -hmm. Sisi is a dictator. Uh, he, made coup he made coup d'etat against uh, 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 elect elected president. Real politics can push the president to uh, to this uh, stage we can uh, uh, we can uh, understand that in politics but i think uh, this is uh, this uh, behavior can send very negative message to the muslim youth that uh, uh, democracy is not absolute system, absolute values. If Islamists gain um, the majority, gain through uh, the power through elections, could it against them is accept, can be accepted. But if could it made by uh, by another uh, fraction, uh, it will be refused. So I think uh, supporting system uh, CC regime uh, can send very negative message to the Muslim youth, to the Islamists everywhere. Real politics can push, can 
can justify or can uh, to this this act but i don't think that he, in long term uh, is is good the second, the second part of the question was more Tunisians. More are Tunisians in are Iraq and Syria. in Iraq and Syria, it's true. And most and more of them, they have been stopped in the, in, uh, in the Tunisian border. <laughs> uh, Minister of Interiors, Tunisian Minister of uh, declared that uh, he stopped about 7,000 Tunisian youth, stopped them in the border prevent them from going to the Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan or Somalia or uh, any uh, feat of uh, battle. Why these uh, peaceful people, Tunisian peace people, how, how these uh, fruits, how these uh, young people uh, mobilized to participate in, in uh, with uh, extremist groups. It's uh, results of Ben Ali regime. This, uh, this youth have, been, have, have not been uh, uh, grow up or educated within the revolution, but uh, before the revolution, when the one Ben Ali regime eradicate in any sort of religiosity. Even the prayer, prayer or, uh, or wearing hijab, all of, all the religious behavior has, uh, has been uh, uh, banned during Ben Ali regime. So the milieu have been prepared uh, to to this generation and this generation have been attracted by Qaeda, by extremism through channels, through internet. By, uh, but I think that uh, extremism has no future in Tunisia because Tunisian people usually is peaceful people and uh, uh, united and uh, uh, there isn't any justification now in Tunisia to uh, educate a new generation linked with uh, extremism. So this phenomena is marginalized. It's margin group and uh, the majority, vast majority, about 94% of Tunisia have signed drafted the Constitution. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Ahmed Badir with United Voices. Uh, Robin mentioned that the case that you're trying to make, investment in democracy and Islamists being in democracy is going to become more harder and that Americans are growing tired of it. But has it been your experience, is the United States investing in democracy, in the Muslim world, or is it an obstacle to democracy? Um, some of the United States partners, especially in the Gulf and throughout the Muslim world, seem to be on the side of dictatorship. Is that investing in democracy? And what can be done about it, especially as you mentioned? And do you think that ISIS is a direct result of America's failed policies? in Iraq and Syria that has led to producing something like ISIS by backing Nouri al-Maliki, who was not democratic, and eventually it led to that. And will the same thing potentially happen in Egypt and even Tunisia if democracy is reversed and the West is seen as supporting dictatorship? Does that, is that the root cause of extremism um, or is it Islam? As I said, the tourism in the region is uh, the heritage of despotism. Mubarak and Bin Ali and Al-Assad and Qaddafi and Bin Ali and uh, Maliki. These the, the spots seed the, the hatred in, in the region. 
They, they didn't far left, they didn't leave any, any space of freedom, any space of, uh, of uh, hope for this. So they, uh, they, they want to the weapons as a response. They consider because there is lack of education also. So it's uh, very easy to mobilize this these people, these young people who are hopeless. They, they, have, they, they haven't any hope, any real education. So they, uh, they, uh, they respond or they accept, they receive the discourse of simplify discourse of Al-Qaeda, of the extremism ISIS. So we have to don't don't accept that on, only or through the military or uh, security means can solve this problem only this this problem cannot solved only through mixed of uh, medicine among it and playing the the, the law and uh, fighting against who take, uh, take weapons. But uh, education, social, uh, also social uh, uh, needs has to, has to be uh, responded. So this problem is complicated problem, cannot be solved through simple methods. We have time for one more question here, and then Robin, if you would like to say anything, and then Shekhanuchi, the final word. Please. Uh, thank you. My name is Ali Ramadan Abu Zakouk. I'm an elected member of the House of Representatives in Libya, the one who is boycotting Tobruk. Uh, <laughs> just to make it clearer. Uh, Sheikh Rashid, it's always good to hear you. I like you as a neighbor and as a leader of the, you know, the uh, Maghreb Union. How do you look at the Libyan situation and what kind of suggestions that you may suggest to solve the Libyan crisis? Our brother Buzakouk, I know him from more than 25 years uh -huh. ago uh -huh. <laughs> in Washington, uh -huh. in, in Virginia. Libya is living now in sort of chaos, and Tunisia, Tunisia situation is affected by our neighbors. About one million, one and a half million Libyan are in Tunisia now. Uh, they living peacefully without any any problem because there is uh, uh, many many relations social and relation between the two people. Uh, I think uh, uh, Libya revolution is different from Tunisia revolution because the Tunisia revolution was peacefully one, but the Libyan uh, has f people forced, have forced to use violence against the former regime. So the, once the weapons become part of the politics, the situation will be complicated. So. Uh, the people who now take, uh, take the weapons don't like to leave it and to, uh, to dialogue. In Tunisia, our problems have been solved through dialogue. In Libya, there is another element, is the, the army, the, the weapons. Um, but I think uh, Tunisia, Libyan, Libyan people uh, is unified also and uh, is, it has uh, a real chance to, uh, to reach its 
unity and uh, its uh, peaceful life, inshallah. I, uh, I'm optimist vis-a-vis -vis Libya, <coughs> but I'm not optimist vis-a-vis -vis Syria and Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> Another topic. Another <laughs> topic is Robin, anything? I, I defer to Sheikh Anushi. The only thing I'll say, and, and the stark difference between Libya and Tunisia. When I was in Libya shortly after my friend Chris Stevens was assassinated, I remember the prime minister telling me that um, there was an average of five weapons for every Libyan, including every newborn. And that's in stark it's, contrast. It's the main heritage of Gaddafi. <laughs> Well, and also that period when they, you know, during eight months of fighting against a regime, I think, you know, these, the, you see these, the, the great thing about Tunisia, you, you don't see arms as an instrument of political power or expression, and I think that's, um, to, that's to be commended. It's to be commended and supported, um, because, and here at the Institute of Peace where we look for Nonviolent means of, of solving disputes, and Tunisia is a great example of that. You, uh, that you need your efforts. <laughs> We're glad to help. I mean, we are glad to help. But the Tunisians in Libya and the Arab world. That's true. There's a lot to be done. Yeah. Um, and we're very pleased to be able to, to sponsor this kind of discussion um, with this model of success. And the international community, including the United States, should support. And I know you're going across the street to encourage that kind of support. So please join me uh, in thanking both Robin and Sheikh Anoushi for our great work. <laughs>